B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Thursday, July 19th, 2018. Trump keeps compounding his errors and his blunders. And he keeps on talking, expecting he can talk his way out of the mess that he's created. And the media and the Democrats are doing their best to keep the harangue going and keep presenting this choice. Oh, it's a false choice. There are only two things. You either believe Putin or you believe the American intelligence community. No other option is available, not even neither one. No, this is a time where loyalties are being defined here in the United States. Russia is this arch enemy. And you got to pick sides. And Trump tries to follow the script that his advisors give him, but he just can't help himself. And now there is outrage over one of the discussion points that apparently occurred in the private meeting between Putin and Trump, where Putin asked if, you know, indeed we allowed American investigators to go to quiz the dirty dozen GRU officers who were indicted on Friday the 13th by Bob Mueller, that he would expect reciprocity. And apparently he was pretty explicit with Trump about exactly who he wants to talk to. Now, at the news conference in Helsinki, Putin talked about Bill Browder. He's the American-slash-British billionaire who had deep investments in Russia, and his lawyer or accountant, depending on who you talk to, a guy named Magnitsky, was imprisoned, allegedly tortured by Putin, and died. This led to the Magnitsky Act passed by Congress, including sanctions that were imposed on Russia during the last year of the Obama administration. But we learned yesterday through the reporting of Spencer Ackerman. He's a talented journalist. He used to write for Wired, then he was at The Guardian, and now he's at The Daily Beast. And he disclosed that Trump apparently told Putin that he would consider. Now, it's not clear what mechanism would be used to force Mike McFaul, a former ambassador to Moscow under Obama, who now resides at Stanford University. There is no indication of how he would persuade or force McFaul to go to Russia or submit to some sort of questioning, either in the United States or on neutral soil. None of that makes any sense under existing law and practice. We don't have extradition treaties with Russia. There is a uh, little-used treaty, which is uh, related to criminal activity. But nobody in the United States has uh, accused McFaul of a crime. And apparently this law requires that uh, the person be accused of violating the law in both countries. I'm not that familiar with it, as you can tell. But the outrage here is warranted. The idea that would Trump that Trump would uh, cooperate with a foreign power and violate the diplomatic immunity of a former U.S. ambassador who's been accused of no wrongdoing, I would accuse him of, him of bad judgment in accepting money to be a paid commentator on MSDNC, but that's his business. And I find McFaul a pretty regular apologist for democratic policies and the demonization of Russia. But that said, there is no basis, no justification whatsoever for this move under American law and precedent. And Trump could face a revolt of his entire diplomatic corps. There could be mass resignations from the State Department and his ambassador ranks if he does go through with this move. And today in the Washington Post, they write the willingness of the White House to contemplate handing over a former U.S. ambassador for interrogation by the Kremlin drew ire and astonishment from current and former U.S. officials. Such a proposition is unheard of. John Kerry, a former Secretary of State, said the administration needs to make it unequivocally clear that in a million years this wouldn't be under consideration, period, full stop. And when you dig into the Browder case, 
I can't really find out who the heroes are here. I'm skeptical of Bill Browder. And exactly what he did in Russia, he was trying to make a lot of money. And he apparently got on Putin's bad side. And bad things can happen in Russia when you <laughs> run afoul of Putin and his minions. So in no case do I want to try to rationalize the behavior of Putin or the Russian state. But the way the Magnitsky Act was uh, brought about, the influence that Browder clearly has in our intelligence circles, they raise my eyebrows. And uh, so I, I don't take sides on this. I don't really know if uh, Browder is clean as a whistle or if he, uh, like many who do business in Russia, have a kind of personal corruption that goes along with it. So there's a lot of outrage, and in uh, the Senate today, there is a vote on a resolution telling Trump not to honor Russian uh, President Putin's request to interview current and former American officials like Mike McFaul. And... This comes uh, uh, on a bill brought by Brian Schatz of Hawaii, Bob Menendez of New Jersey, hardly clean as a whistle, that guy, and the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. But a lot of this is grandstanding. They're looking for ways to damage Trump and the Republican brand, hoping that this helps persuade voters to elect Democrats in November. And lifelong Republican St. James Comey, the former FBI director and now a best-selling author, he's cashing in. He issued word yesterday that he wants uh, everybody to vote Democratic. He, he didn't pick any individual people. He just made it clear that he wants to see Democratic majorities this fall. And perhaps this could create the climate for the blue wave that so many Democrats have been fantasizing about. The other move by Democrats to capitalize on this is to demand that the State Department serve up the translator, who was the only other American present in the room when Putin and Trump met privately. Her name is Maria Gross. She works for the State Department. And this is an unprecedented move as well. And I, while I'm curious and gosh, I'd like to know what they said in there, I don't think that it's wise to make these kinds of critical changes without some indication that a crime was committed or, you know, something more serious is afoot. And at the New York Times today, they're keeping the pressure on, again, behind this binary choice, choose Putin or the CIA. And they are disclosing more details that have only been hinted about in the past. They say that on uh, January 6th of 2017, when all of Obama's spymasters went to Trump Tower, to brief the incoming, it's hard to say, president, uh, that he kind of begrudgingly accepted that Russia had interfered in the election, that the CIA had a top secret source close to Putin, so delicate that John Brennan would not commit to documents that were in any kind of circulation, the information coming from this deep source, and, of course, that could be made up. It could be true. We don't have a way of verifying that. So in the omniscient voice of the Times, David Sanger, the Washington bureau chief, along with Matthew Rosenberg, say that Trump's shifting narrative underscores the, deg the degree to which he regularly picks and chooses intelligence to suit his political purposes. Never been more clear than this week. Trump's fear, according to his closest aides, is that any admission of even an unsuccessful Russian attempt to influence the 2016 vote raises questions about the legitimacy of his presidency. But consider the context, okay? Trump is a paranoid guy. And he sits down with the spy chiefs, Clapper, Brennan. These are the two guys who are driving the Russiagate narrative now. And the third was Mike Rogers, director of the NSA. And, of course, St. James Comey was there. And after the group briefing, Comey dropped the Steele dossier on Trump. Now, 
I have enough skepticism of the FBI, and I go back to the J. Edgar Hoover days when this was a device used to compromise people, used to get them to submit to the deep state. And while I think Trump has fears and paranoia that go beyond rational thinking, <laughs> I empathize with how he may have reacted and said, look, this can't be true. They're, they're trying to, to handcuff me with this stuff. And, of course, his own ability to create reality and deny the obvious is something that we've seen time after time. So Trump's walking back of his misstatements, his misspokes, is getting so rhythmic and regular now, maybe he, he will start to moonwalk things back. <laughs> Yesterday, he told a reporter, and this is how he keeps talking and he should just shut up, he told the CBS Evening News, I laid down the law with Putin. I let him know we can't have this. We're not going to have it. And that's the way it's going to be. Now, it doesn't actually say what it is. <laughs> but, of course, I guess that is uh, election interference, hacking, attempts to impact American public opinion. And as you know, I see the details of the Mueller indictment I see references to more evidence, and a case is being built. I do acknowledge that. I've been a sharp skeptic, and I want to be honest with you, my valued listeners. But at the same time, it is maddening to see how this is politicized and how we have been driven down this uh, little gauntlet where we must choose between Russia and the CIA. And as Trump furiously tries to spin and lie his way out of this, he said, well, you know, the summit with Russia was a great success, and he wants another meeting, so we can start implementing some of the many things discussed, he said, including stopping terrorism, security for Israel, nuclear proliferation, cyber attacks, trade, Ukraine, Middle East, peace, North Korea, and more. He says, all these problems can be solved. Well, that's pretty fanciful, Donnie. But when you look at the situation you have created for yourself and what we learn on almost a daily basis, Trump is clearly making his problems worse. And the Democrats, for their part, are making some gains, gathering some momentum in tarnishing Trump's image and uh, hoping to neutralize some of his Twitter fans who are likely Republican voters this fall. And if the Russophobia is a little too overpowering for you, I got a little antidote, a couple of uh, articles to recommend. One at Counterpunch by C.J. Hopkins entitled Trump's Treasonous Traitor Summit or How Liberals Started to Learn to Stop Worrying and Love the New McCarthyism. And... Hopkins writes that despite all of the hubbub that we've seen over the last few days, that life goes on. The destabilization of the Middle East, the privatization of virtually everything, the conversion of the planet into one big shopping mall, and other global capitalist projects are all going forward uninterrupted. Apart from Trump making a narcissistic, word salad babbling jackass of himself, which he does on a more or less daily basis, nothing particularly apocalyptic happened. And so, once again, Western liberals and others obsessed with, obsessed with Trump, having been teased into a painfully tumescent paroxysm of anticip anticipation of some unimaginably horrible event that would finally lead to Trump's impeachment or removal by other means, they were left standing around with their hysteria in their hands. Now, I think the sexual references here are pretty clear. He basically says the Democrats are dry-humping, their voters. He says, like a twisted pseudo-tantric exercise where the media get liberals all lathered up over whatever fresh horror Trump has just perpetrated, build the tension for several days until liberals are moaning and begging for impeachment or a full-blown CIA-sponsored coup, then pull out abruptly and leave the poor bastards writhing, <laughs> writhing in agony until the next time. And a little less uh, salacious analysis at World Socialist website 
under the byline of Bill Van Auken and a tip to Carl Howard for linking me to this article, which he says <laughs> reflects some of my expressions recently. Well, Van Auken notes uh, that this treason charge is overblown and that it's reminiscent of the work of John Stormer, who wrote a pro-Goldwater book called None Dare Call It Treason, published in 1964. And it carried a blurb, 1964 is a year of crisis and decision. Will America continue to aid the communist enemy to disarm in the face of danger, to bow before communist dictators in every corner of the earth? The decision is yours. And Van Auken says this paranoid style is finding undeniable echoes from within the Democratic Party and the New York Times. Just two days ago, the newspaper's ineffable foreign affairs columnist Tom Friedman described Trump as an asset of Russian intelligence and issued a similar call to arms. Quote, my fellow Americans, we are in trouble and we have some big decisions to make today. Last year, Friedman used his column to address an open letter appealing to the military officers in the, tr officers in the Trump administration to remove the president by means of a palace coup. And, of course, like me, he sees the fingerprints of John Brennan and Jimmy Clapper on all this. What unlikely guardians of the truth, he says. As directors of the CIA or national intelligence, all of them oversaw torture, black sites, extraordinary rendition, and drone assassinations, as well as other crimes carried out behind the backs of the American people. And these are the sage seers who we look to for the truth today. Over at The Intercept, I noticed the arrival of Eric Lichtblau. He used to co-author pieces with James Risen at the New York Times. Lichtblau left for CNN, where he was fired last fall after a flap over a source and some reporting. And what Lichtblau lays out in what I think is his first piece for The Intercept is that the Inspector General's report that reviewed the FBI's actions in 2016 had some findings that really didn't get the same attention when it was released. And he says the most startling explanation is that the Russia probe distracted the top FBI people to such a degree that when the Wiener laptop appeared with this new collection of Hillary Clinton emails, that they dropped the ball. And this is the explanation given for about three weeks during October when they seemed to be fumbling around to get a warrant to look at the Clinton emails on Wiener's laptop because it, you know, wasn't related to the original investigation of his sexting with an underage girl. So the IG concluded that the urgent demands of the Russia investigation and other explanations offered by FBI officials didn't justify the month-long delay in the Clinton email case. And what Lichtblau asserts here or opines, I think is more accurate, is that the diversion into the Trump-Russia investigation delayed Comey's public statements about the renewed investigation into Clinton's emails because of the Wiener laptop and may have affected the outcome of the election because of the timing of those statements and the way some Democrats believe the polls shifted. Now, this is another artful explanation of why Hillary Clinton lost. And nobody ever says, why was it ever so close that the election could be rigged in Michigan, that the election could be impacted by a handful of voters affected by Jim Comey's late-breaking statements about Clinton's emails? No, it is, it's based on the sense that Hillary Clinton was entitled to become president and that there were all of these evil forces that combined and colluded to deny her her rightful ascendance. And I'm sorry. The way the Democrats refused to face the loss of 2016 and change their policies to attract voters, the debacle that Putin himself noted, that the DNC rigged the primaries against Bernie Sanders and in favor of Hillary Clinton, and the other note that Putin made is that all those hacked emails were true. They weren't forgeries. They weren't modified. That's how it happened. And the mass denial 
and this shifting of blame to Russia is just stunning to me. Now, we're hearing this effort to force Trump to acknowledge that Russia has nefarious intent for our midterm elections this November. And if it's an information operation, I call bullshit. Now, if they're concerned about hacking, voting registration, and actual vote tabulation, the answer is simple, and I've been advocating it since 2001. H. C. P. B. Hand counted paper ballots. That is the path forward to get away from hacking and any kind of uh, potential interference. It might slow down the vote count. Who cares? We had elections here in California. The mayor of San Francisco recently, a special election there after the mayor died. It took two full weeks for the ranked choice voting to be tabulated to a point where the losers conceded and the winner declared victory. Nobody lost a lot of sleep over it. It wasn't a big deal. And it's the demand of the television networks, the electronic media, that we know the results on the night of the election that drives computerized voting and vote tabulation that creates the vulnerabilities. So thanks to Dick Attlee in Maine, he sent me an article that the Secretary of State of Maine has filed a request for $3 million in Help America Vote funds to pay for improved cybersecurity and training of municipal election officials. Why waste time and money on that? Go to the printer now and print enough paper ballots and hire enough people so they can be counted at the precinct level and find a way to securely transfer those tabulations to the central vote counting at the registrar or wherever it happens to be. These are not complicated issues. And yet, we see time and time again that our elected officials refuse to confront them. And over at Who, What, Why today, my colleague Jimmy Falls exposes how the electronic voting machines that were made by ESNS included remote access software built in. They used the publicly available uh, software made by Symantec, which is called PC Anywhere. It was pre-installed on these voting machines and on computers that are used at the, you know, to maintain the voter rolls and other administrative tasks of election officials. And Peter uh, Philip Stark, I'm sorry, a physicist and mathematician at UC Berkeley, said, look, voting systems should be owned by the public. The private sector continues to demonstrate that it puts profit before the security and trustworthiness of elections. Understandably, it sells what there is a market for. However, vendors have repeatedly acted in bad faith to market systems that are obviously not secure. And yesterday, Maria Butina was back in federal court in Washington, and they dropped the sex package. This ensures that the media will salivate, tabloid eyes, and go into full frenzy mode whenever they decide to put Maria Butina, the alleged Russian red-headed spy, on trial. What we learned is that she offered sex to uh, somebody, we think it was at the NRA, in exchange for a job. And she had a boyfriend the FBI doesn't believe she was in love with. She was just using him. He was 26 years older than her. And uh, she expressed privately disdain and got him to do her homework so she could get her graduate degree at American University. Now, some of this plays out like a soap opera. But I do see that the Butina case is uh, apparently a pretty strong case of Russian spying and an attempt to infiltrate the NRA and Christian prayer groups. We're being told the leaks keep coming here. Prosecutors say Butina kept in touch with Russian intelligence operatives. This past March, she had dinner with a Russian diplomat, described by prosecutors as a suspected uh, Russian intelligence officer. And he left the, the U.S. two weeks later at about the time a dozen Russian intelligence officers, officers were expelled from the United States. Every day I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. 
Great people like Carla Mahoney, Benny Alto, Patrick Gray, and I also want to mention that Professor Mark Crispin Miller of NYU put out an appeal again the other day. He is fighting chronic Lyme disease, and his insurance doesn't cover it, and his own resources uh, apparently are tapped out. So if you're in a position to kick in a little extra cash to Mark Crispin Miller, I encourage you to do that. Uh, I'll put up a link in the show file for this podcast. Let me make a note of that, uh, Miller, uh, so that you could uh, drop a, a few coins on him via PayPal. And I don't want to neglect my own needs here. If you're not a subscriber, you can fix that. Come on over to PeterBCollins.com. All you have to do is click on the menu tab, then click on Become a Subscriber, and it'll land you on the sign-up page where you can take care of business. And for my subscribers today, I'm releasing part two of our two-part series about wrongful conviction and misconduct by prosecutors. And in an interview that really touched me, Jeff Deskovic describes how at the age of 16, he was accused and then later convicted of a rape and murder of a high school classmate. He didn't do it. He wasn't there. The DNA showed that there was not a match between his DNA and the semen captured in the rape kit from the victim. And there were other anomalies, including misuse of polygraph in order to squeeze him for a false confession. Here's an excerpt from my conversation with Jeff Deskovic. I, I, had to, I had to constantly fight off feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, uh, depression. At times, I thought about suicide. Um, at other times, sometimes I was doubting what my own senses were telling me. Like, I was, am I really here in, in prison for a murder and rape I didn't commit? Uh, so there, there was that part of it. And then it, I would describe it as a, a nonstop obstacle course, you know, with the guards, prisoners, and the staff as obstacles to the main goal, which is overturn the conviction, regain my freedom. To put further perspective, I mean, I lost, I lost, um, I didn't, I didn't graduate high school. I didn't go to the prom, uh, births, deaths, weddings, holidays, rites of passage, finishing my education at a more traditional age, being on my way in a career. I mean, I, I wasn't just the loss of freedom, but I mean, all those things. And then, you know, prison was very dangerous. I, I was beat up at times. One time I was, I was almost um, killed. I got hit on the side of my head multiple times with a 10 pound weight plate because the person thought I was a rapist and I was guilty. I invite you to listen to the full interview with Jeff Deskovic. It is touching and he has devoted the rest of his life. He's currently in the third year of law school to addressing wrongful conviction and his foundation has won the release of a number of individuals who were wrongfully incarcerated. I think Jeff Deskovic is a, a really interesting guy and I hope you check out the in-depth interview podcast. Well, we've been talking about the bill that was circulating in the Knesset in Israel, an apartheid bill that declares that only Jews have the right to self-determination in Israel, and it essentially confers second-class citizenship on the 20% of Israel's population who are not Jewish, largely Arabs. The legislation stipulates that Israel is the historic homeland of the Jewish people. They have an exclusive right to national self-determination. It strips Arabic of its designation as an official language. And reaction has been swift. EU Foreign Affairs Chief Federica Mogherini, we are concerned, we have expressed this concern, will continue to engage with Israeli authorities. It was also condemned from an unlikely source, Turkey's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, saying the legislation tramples on the principles of universal law and disregards the rights of the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Eamon O'Day, who is the head of the Israeli-Arab Joint List Group, said this is the death of our democracy. It passed by 62 to 55 in the Knesset, and there was some of the most uh, onerous language that was modified in the final bill, but it would still apparently allow the establishment of Jewish-only communities in the state of Israel. I mentioned Turkey, surprised that they would weigh in and criticize Israel because uh, President Recep uh, Tayyip Erdogan was just inaugurated for his next term. He's been there for 15 years, but he keeps uh, strengthening his power. 
and he now can run the entire country virtually by decree. He can appoint almost anybody. The prime minister's office was abolished. The military is directly under his control. He will draft the budget, choose judges and many top officials, and he can dismiss parliament at will. A new study released by the human rights advocacy group Fortify Rights is very explicit. The military in Myanmar systematically planned their genocidal campaign to rid the country of Rohingya Muslims. This led to the exodus of 700,000 last year. They're all trapped in Bangladesh. And it followed a campaign that was carefully created. Mass slaughter, rape, village burnings in the Rakhine State in Myanmar. Fortify Rights names 22 military and police officers who they say were directly responsible for the campaign against the Rohingya. It is a really ugly and brutal blight on the global scene and the silence of the United States and so many others is something that won't be forgotten. A Spanish court is pissed off at the German court that refused to grant full extradition of the bad boy from Barcelona, Carles Puigdemont. And Puigdemont and five others are now seeing their charges dismissed by the Spanish court. Now, the international warrant is being dismissed, but there are still national arrest warrants in force. That means that Puigdemont and the others can travel in the European Union, but if they cross the Spanish border, they will likely be arrested. In Britain, we have leaks su suggesting that police uh, may have identified the suspected perpetrators of the alleged Novichok attacks. Investigators believe they have identified the suspected perpetrators through closed-circuit television. They've cross-checked those uh, photos with records of people who entered the country, and they are sure the suspects are Russian. Now, this is all coming from unnamed sources, and the Metropolitan Police has denied this. Their security minister tweeted that the report belonged in the ill-informed and wild speculation folder. And finally today, you've probably heard in recent weeks some lefty Democrats calling for the abolishment, the abolition of ICE, Immigrations and Customs Enforcement. It came out of the campaign of uh, Ocasio-Cortez in New York, and uh, I understand why people want to abolish ICE. And yesterday, the Republican-controlled House set up a gotcha vote. Now, they could have brought up a, a vote on a measure that explicitly would call for the abolition of ICE. But instead, they wrote a resolution, a love fest, a declaration of support for the people who round up immigrants and uh, separate parents and children. Now, 18 Democrats actually voted against this resolution, which puts them on record and vulnerable to Republican attacks as being in favor of abolishing ICE. 133 Democrats voted present, so they declined to support the majority Republican maneuver, but they protected their own political asses in the same maneuver. Thanks for listening to my news and comment podcast today. You're free to share it far and wide. We post it on YouTube, and I hope you'll go and look for it there. I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again happy trail